You're listening to Conferences on Line Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is October 19, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, sublingual immunotherapy. Our presenter is Dr. Linda Cox. She's the president-elect of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and she's also a clinical professor at Nova Southeastern University in Davie, Florida. And there you go. So uh, we're really fortunate uh, now to, uh, we're going to switch, our, switch gears now and talk about immunotherapy, but as opposed to the typical injection immunotherapy that we're familiar with, uh, Linda Cox has been uh, working with sublingual immunotherapy. Uh, Linda also happens to be the president-elect of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, so we're doubly fortunate to have her here today. Um, so uh, thank, thank you for joining us today, uh, Dr. Cox. You, are you in Florida also? I'm sorry, what did you say, Jay? Are you also in Florida? You're from uh, uh, Fort Lauderdale, right? I'm in West Palm Beach, which is where I live, but I do practice in Fort Lauderdale, and it's kind of a little overcast, but it's 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 nice. You could still so this is place. our this is our Florida morning. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today, Linda. Was Tim uh, in Florida? Yeah, he was in Orlando. Oh, okay, okay. Well. Thank you for inviting me back again. We had so much to talk about last time that I had to split this talk into two talks. And I guess that's good news because uh, in the past I've given one talk, just a general overview of SLIT. But this particular topic is specifically on the status of SLIT in the United States. And in the past I would not have had enough uh, to present a full presentation on this. So uh, some good news, there's been a lot of uh, studies that have been recently conducted, and um, and I'm going to present or focus mostly on the U.S. clinical trials. And there will be both uh, a pharmaceutical company sponsored as, or actually it's extract manufacturer, with the exception of uh, during trial Merck, there is a pharmaceutical company involved in slit products in the U.S., but um, generally the uh, slit allergen extract products are coming from extract manufacturers, not pharmaceutical industry. I'm not sure if that's so important. But it brings me to my uh, disclosure slide. Relevant to this discussion, I um, uh, have been a consultant for Stellagen, specifically the principal investigator of their U.S. slick tablet product. That study has been completed several years ago, and the publication is uh, will be uh, forthcoming in the December issue of Jackie. Uh, some of these uh, disclosures are currently outdated. The Thermo Fisher and Baxter are now outdated in terms of the 12-month look back. Um, so the learning objectives of this presentation is to review um, the status of the ongoing and completed U.S. clinical trials to discuss allergen dose and formulation. And it's important to know that there are differences, at least if you look at the published literature, on how the different formulations, tablet versus solution, have performed in clinical trials to date. Discuss the adverse effects of slit in clinical trials, and that's going to be more generalized to what's been published. Most of it is out of the United States. And then focus on some practical considerations concerning slit, particularly regarding patient experience. Now, this is a, a timeline. Dana Wallace actually created this for an article that we wrote, and I put some of the balloons uh, to kind of highlight the, the kind of uh, landmarks in U.S. slit um, timeline. Um, she used the program called Vizio or something like that. I, I was not able to manipulate it very well, so I used old um, plain old insert balloons to make these revisions. But, um, in 1986, the very first uh, double-blind placebo-controlled slit trial was conducted in Europe by Glenis Stodding. It was a very short study. It was very low dose, but they did demonstrate efficacy. And then a slit, I would say, sort of took off in Europe. And in the ensuing 20-plus years, uh, it is really uh, gaining widespread acceptance in some parts of Europe, particularly Italy and France. It is the most frequently prescribed new immunotherapy form 
or route of the prescription. Um, however, I don't think we really paid much, at, we, U.S., paid much attention until early 2000s. And I recall at a college meeting, at the Immunotherapy Committee meeting, the FDA was chair of at that time, and I was incoming vice chair. It was decided that we would uh, put together a group that would perform a literature review and publish. Uh, at the time, it was going to be a rostrum, but it ended up being a comprehensive uh, literature review. And that was in 2004. And um, at that time, Greer had um, decided that Greer is a US manufacturer, decided that they were going to embark upon the slick clinical trial. And they got approval to start their phase one uh, safety and dosing study for four different allergens. Um, and then there were several clinical trials that uh, were tried, and there, there were failures, some of which uh, never actually formally published results. Uh, there were uh, several grass, two grass uh, studies that were failed, probably because of poor pollen season. But then in 2009, Merck, which had the license for the ALK grass tablet product, uh, met primary outcomes. So this is really the first US study that met primary outcome. And there were two different studies, pediatric and adults. And now as I fast forward to 2012, uh, as of this date, um, we still have yet to have a FDA approved formulation for uh, sublingual immunotherapy. Now this is the paper that I just mentioned. And uh, Jay was, a, uh, you were an author on it, weren't you, Jay? Or, no, you were part of the work group and review group. Right. Um, um, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. yes. It looks like it's winter out in, in Aspen. I see snow in the background. Was that? But it says July, so that's very strange. Yeah, it's so there's a uh, you know, the conference in Aspen. And this is where Hal and Elson wanted us to uh, convene our first draft. So we did. And so we were due for the to of the October of uh, the prior year. Actually, it ended up being a because we kept doing it. This was the first draft. What we found, um, are you hearing an echo? We are. What can we do about that? It just I came out. Do you want me to try to call in on a regular phone? You want me to mute and unmute? Let me see. I don't think there's any change. Hello? Hello? Yeah. We're here. Let's see if that, can you? Start talking again, Dr. Cox, and we can see if. OK. I think it's good. It's a little bit better. OK. So when we looked at all the studies, at that point, we just looked at randomized control studies that provided symptom medication scores. We found that 38% did not meet those efficacy landmarks in the first year, and 35% did. And what we could not find was a consistent relationship between allergen dose, treatment duration, clinical efficacy. Clearly like you could see with subcutaneous immunotherapy, which is kind of a range of 5 to 20 micrograms of the major allergen. Um, and what was very apparent and continues to be apparent is there's significant heterogeneity in the design of uh, at least the early slit studies. So I do think that has changed. And I think these large new, uh, clinical trials that have been conducted in the past couple of years, both in Europe and the United States, are getting much more homogenous in terms of study design, the outcome they're looking at. But one thing that has to be kept in mind, and uh, this was brought up uh, during a work group, a writing group by Dick Lockie, um, he, he felt very strongly that there's an issue with the fact that there's not a true placebo in slip because you can't really mimic the effects of allergen underneath the tub. I know that Hal Nelson in one of his trials tried to do so with histamine but you cannot evoke the same effect as allergen underneath the tongue. So the question is, does this have some effect on people's perception of efficacy? And there have been analysis, and I think they have been published, that have looked at, did you know what group you're in? Did the side effects affect your perception of efficacy? And apparently it doesn't. The other real pitfall, and this goes across the board with all immunotherapy clinical trials, in my opinion, as I look into this more and more, is 
what outcomes should we be measuring? Uh, what should the primary outcome be? Um, is it a single outcome? Is it a composite outcome? What's statistically versus clinically meaningful for the patient? Now, the World Allergy Organization did issue a document a few years ago that established some guidelines on what should be, uh, how immunotherapy clinical trials should be conducted. And their recommendation was primary outcome should be a combined clinic, uh, symptom and medication score. And this score should be at least 20% higher than the placebo group. This is just some background. Um, I'm going to skip these right now and give you some perspective about other treatments. And this is looking at antihistamines and nasal steroids in uh, clinical trials. I believe these come from actual package inserts. And when you look at the, the two nasal steroid sprays, you're looking at about a 16 um, to 18 percent improvement. Forget about those little minus signs. There's a little clerical error there. But it's a 16 to 18% improvement with nasal steroids and about an 8% improvement with antihistamine. And, and a similar magnitude of improvement with monolutas, about 8%. So you're talking about a magnitude of approval over placebo in the range of 8 to 18% with comparable pharmacotherapy, which is the comparison treatment for immunotherapy. And, and remember, these studies are designed a little differently. In general, these are short studies, these uh, pharmacotherapy studies, two weeks. Uh, and they're not allowed to have rescue medication. Whereas in most, most immunotherapy, if not all, uh, rescue medication is allowed. And, it's, and it is almost always total pollen season. It's not just a two-week period. Though often, as secondary analysis, they will look at peak the pollen season, which is two weeks. So they, they usually, for primary outcome, use total pollen season, and then they peak the pollen season as a secondary outcome. This is a very recent table that was put together by Moises Calderon. Moises is, works in the UK with Steve Durham, and he has been involved in several of these Cochrane meta-analysis for immunotherapy. He was the lead author of the subcutaneous Cochrane meta-analysis, and his group has looked at SLID and the original one that was published in 05, and then they have published updates. And what he did here uh, is look at SKIT and SLID, and this is symptom scores, uh, and looked at standardized mean differences. This is, this is what you'll see when you look at a meta-analysis, but you'll see it as a forest plot. Are you all familiar with a forest plot? That's that big line, and then you look to see if it's on the right or the left, and that will tell you if the treatment effect is, is significant and in favor or not in favor of particular treatment. So that SMD is the standardized mean difference, and that's the pooled um, means um, uh, divided by the uh, standard deviation. And a, a great effect is, or a high effect is considered greater than 0.8, medium is about 0.5, and a poor effect is 0.2. So you can see all the slit studies. There's a bit of a range, ranging from a, a, a low effect of 0.32 to a, to a high effect, depending on which um, meta-analysis you're looking at. And then when you look at SPIT, uh, it's, it, it's a little bit higher. So there's suggestion in these meta-analysis that maybe there might be a greater uh, magnitude of uh, efficacy versus slit. And the very few comparative studies have suggested that. But it, there's still a lot more studies that need to be done to really establish which, which therapy is more effective than the other. And I, personally, I don't think it's that important because there are pros and cons to both therapies. It, is, it requires uh, administration in a supervised medical facility if you're following guidelines. And where a standard of care with SLIT is it's at a home treatment, so you're balancing convenience and uh, maybe trading off the efficacy, maybe not. And this is the same analysis with medication scores, which again, you can see there's a, um, a, a fairly consistent with rhinitis and asthma for SPIT, but there's a big range in the SLIT study in terms of the standardized mean difference. 
Now, heterogeneity is um, something that's used in the meta-analysis, uh, and the score is I squared. And a significant heterogeneity is uh, greater than 75%. So you can see that there's an enormous amount of heterogeneity, actually, in all these clinical trials, but particularly SLIT. In, um, actually, it's not in this particular slide, but in, in, in these studies. So I'm going to move on beyond all this um, analysis and just uh, summarize this background with uh, what kind of magnitude of effect do we see with uh, at least recent uh, immunotherapy trials. And this is looking at two uh, SLIT studies and one SKIT study, all using about the same dose. But with SLIT, it's administered daily versus SKIT, it's administered generally monthly. Um, the SKIT product is 20 micrograms of a major uh, group 5 allergen. The slip product was 15 to 25 percent. And you can see a comparable magnitude of improvement over placebo between SPIT and SLIT when you look at these separate studies in terms of medication and the scores. Any questions about all this background before I move on to the U.S. clinical trials? Wherever you guys are. <laughs> Okay, so I mentioned that uh, Rear was the first uh, set, first company to begin clinical trials with the intent or hope of having an FDA-approved product for sublingual use, and they looked at four allergens. Their protocol, uh, their dose escalation protocol, is a single day. You would call it a rush protocol, and it, it was maximum tolerated dose. So you can see from the slide that maximum tolerance dose for cat and dust mite range from 50 to 2,000 BAU, ragweed from 31 to 91 AU, um, AMA1 units, which equals micrograms of AMA1 units is the uh, FDA terminology, and then 50 to about 21,000 BAUs for clinophase, a pretty big range of maximum tolerated dose, and really no, no concerning safety issues in this uh, phase one study. And then uh, a bit, bit of time elapsed, AOK, Abella, and Greer both attempted a GRASS, GRASS trials. I guess it was in 2007. That was the year that might have been a bad GRASS pollen year. Other, other questions about or other possibilities that were raised was patient selection, whether patient severe enough. And, and patient severity for natural pollen count exposure comes up in other forms of immunotherapy uh, as a possible reason for treatment failure. I'm not sure if you all remember, how, if, you, if you're first year followers, you probably hadn't heard about it, but there was a ragweed product uh, called Tulumba. It was CPG bound to ragweed, and it looked really good in the phase one and two trials, but when they went to phase three and looked at their interim year one data, they didn't see a difference between their treatment group or placebo group um, in after during season, but they didn't see an increase in symptoms. So there was a concern that um, um, there was uh, the study would not be successful for that reason, either patient selection or um, not enough allergen exposure. And that's a real pitfall with immunotherapy clinical trials because. Uh, efficacy is determined during natural exposure, which is during, well, if it's a seasonal allergen, uh, during pollen season. So really, there's some dependence on, on uh, nature providing enough allergen. There is look, or there, there is starting to be a look in FDA's, I understand, considering environmental chamber challenges, at least for the phase two dosing, uh, dose response studies. And this was a study conducted a few years. It was a CAT study. Uh, the, the company was Planet Technology, who had purchased antigen labs. And they looked at two doses of CAT, about 0.48 versus 4.8 micrograms daily. And they did look at environmental chamber exposure, as well as the other standard endpoints, which is daily symptom medication scores. Never released the results um, of this study. And I'm not sure if they've gone back to looking at um, cat allergen. I heard informally that it was there was no significant difference between the three groups, because I think there was placebo as well. 
um, in the Environmental Chamber Challenge or the um, daily symptom medications course. Uh, of interest, uh, there is, and this is a little bit of an aside, but a, a cat peptide study that's getting ready to launch a uh, multi-country, I think at least Canada, U.S., uh, peptide study. So that, that's about ready to launch, and that's an injection therapy and not a supplement. So I'm going to move on to specific allergens. Grass, I think without argument, is probably the most studied sublingual product. And this is uh, the first dose response study. I'd say it was a landmark study of sublingual immunotherapy. And it was conducted in Europe, 855 patients. And the protocol was they had to uh, be treated at least eight weeks before, or it was attempted at least eight weeks before uh, the season began, but not all patients actually uh, got the full eight weeks. And they looked at three doses with the highest dose being 15 micrograms of 55. And what they found was when they looked at the entire high dose group, they met efficacy of medication, but not, uh, not symptom scores, unless they teased out the group that had at least eight weeks of treatment. So as a result of this, uh, the subsequent studies um, were modified not modified, but um, they started treatment four months before season. Um, and so this product that was, again, the landmark product that showed that 15 micrograms given at least eight weeks before season achieved um, significant improvement in both medication symptom scores, which is um, a requirement if you're seeking an FDA approved product, um, as well as proving safety. Um, was conducted both in children and adults in two separate clinical trials and published last year in Jackie. And the pediatric study did meet primary outcome, which was the combined symptom scores improved by 26%. And then the immunologic parameters also showed the expected changes that were favorable or associated with effective immunotherapy. Um, in terms of treatment-related effects, in the U.S. clinical trials, it was required that patients uh, be prescribed epinephrine auto-injector. This is not a requirement in Europe, and it's not standard of care, my understanding, in Europe as well. And it was actually used by one slip patient who had coughed with angioedema after the first dose. Uh, another patient uh, went to the emergency room but later was diagnosed with uh, viral uh, pharyngitis, and then another, these were the sort of uh, epinephrine use patients, not sort of, they were the patients who used epinephrine in these were the circumstances. And then one of the placebo patients used it 12 hours after the 137th dose. Wheezing, but it was later thought that the wheezing that they had experienced that prompted the use of the epinephrine was related to the immunograssy here. So this was the first published um, uh, North American study that demonstrated efficacy of a sublingual product. I would I would like some pause for thought and consideration from the fellows. Is um, this is going to be a little bit of a consideration and struggle, although it may not be because uh, it may be a requirement in the past insert that patients be prescribed epinephrine auto injectors. But if these products are approved. Um, would we, um, as U.S. practicing allergists, be then prescribing all of our foot patients epinephrine auto-injectors? Thoughts on that? And in and, case and it's on the practice parameters, I imagine the group, uh, there would be a writing group that would have to tackle this question. We struggled with this question for subcutaneous immunotherapy, where you know patients are in a medical facility supervised for a period of time after administration, and most of the severe, almost all the severe reactions have been reported within 30 minutes. But this is home administration. And this placebo person um, kind of underscores that there could be instances where people are using this, and it, it, it's, it's not related to, the, to a medication adverse effect. Well, actually, both of these, because this was apparently diagnosed as viral pharyngitis. Any thoughts? Well, let me finish up with the other part of this study, and this was the adults, and there was also, again, um, 
um, epinephrine use, two in the treatment group, and one in placebo. And, and one of the uh, placebo, the placebo person, it was thought that they used their epinephrine in response to an anxiety attack. <laughs> so, of course, you know when you give somebody epinephrine, they're having an anxiety attack. It's, it's, it's probably oh. a little more. <laughs> you I, never I, know. I, I, no, I had to look this, and I was to the fact that I said I should have known. I said, "Oh my God, I've really made this worse." So, because you give somebody, you inject somebody with their allergic to, and they're a little hyper vigilant and anxious to begin with, and then they start imagining, and then you give them epinephrine. <laughs> so this is just food for thought to digest and think about. But this is the adult study that combined symptom indications for net significance at point. This is not a U.S. study, but this is the same product, and this product has been studied now two years after three years of continuous treatment. It's been studied two years after discontinuation. So this is looking at duration of efficacy of sublingual immunotherapy, specifically, again, the grass tablet, the 15 micrograms. And you see within the first year, they have a significant improvement that's sustained in year two and three. This particular treatment is continuous. They start before season and go through continuously for three years. Then they stop, and then year four and year five, which is now just published, the efficacy is maintained, 37 percent. Important. This is the product, uh, the, the other grass tablet product. Uh, there's two large, there's two major extract manufacturers in the world. I think they're number one and two, and that's ALK and Stalagins. This is Stalagins product. I was just showing you ALKs. This is their dose response study. It's a little different from the previous product because it, it, it's composed of five, um, five northern grasses. And the feeling of the developers of this product is these, um, these Grasses have some epitope differences in the major allergen in T5, and that actually has been looked at and published in an earlier publication. And why these five grasses were selected, my understanding is these were the five most common grasses in the world. And they looked at three doses. Their unit is IRs, and IR is based on comparison with titrated Crick's skin cap. So they looked at three doses. The 300 IR is roughly 25 micrograms of T5. And they found a significant improvement in the two treatment groups, 300 and 500, in the first season. Again, they started four months before draft season. And um, they found, I believe, a little better safety profile in, um, in the uh, 300 group, and that's the dose they pursued for further development. Now, this is the US clinical trial. I mentioned that I was the principal investigator. This is a multi-center study, 51 centers. It was adults, 473 randomized adults. Their inclusion requirement was they had to have a 5 millimeter wheel with an associated 10 millimeters of erythema on skin test for Timothy grass extract. Um, they also had to have a retrospective uh, rhinitis total symptom score of 12. There were six symptom scores, four, four, four nasal and two eye. And that was retrospective previous year. They had to have stable asthma they had asthma. And they um, could have other sensitivities, but they couldn't be symptomatic to that allergen during grass pollen season. So they could have, they could have a, a ragweed sensitivity, or they could even have um, dust mite as long as they didn't have really active symptoms. And that was investigator decided, determined. But they couldn't have Bahia or Johnson or Bermuda because those grass sensitivity, um, in, in, if they were living in an area where those grasses were endemic, they could not be included because that would confound the results. And these are the clinical uh, uh, center sites, just for your FYI. And um, this was an effective study in that it uh, met primary outcome combined symptom scores, 28% reduction. Uh, there were no serious adverse reactions, no epinephrine use. The study was also required for the patients to have epinephrine auto-injector and no um, 
no asthma, no asthma systemic reaction. What's novel about this particular product, and I brought this up on the previous presentation, is that when we looked at specific RGE to Timothy, and this was an exploratory outcome. In Europe, it's required. You have to have a positive specific RGE to the allergen, and it's usually 0.75. But when we looked at the group that had none, this was a subset of people, and it was, uh, I guess, a total of 40, 49 patients that had no specific IgE, 26 in the treatment group. There was no uh, difference between the two, the placebo and the treatment group, but there were also really no symptoms during grass pollen season. So this, you know, we could speculate on why, you know, what this means and why we saw this, but um, it does suggest that, at least for clinical trials, maybe specific IgE should be one of the inclusion criteria. This has been accepted in jacking or will be in December issue, and possibly have a print next month. Any questions? Okay. And this is that, oh, go ahead. One, one question, this is Paul Dowling. Um, have any of these studies been done in people with asthma? Oh, almost all these studies have asthma. I'm sorry. Um, I, uh, there's one thing, you had an FEV1 greater than 80% or something, um, and I think the, the last study. So um, are these people that, you know, have very, very mild asthma or, I mean. Have they have to have mild asthma. Um, you know, we usually, you know, traditionally um, we've used 70% as the cutoff for asthma and just traditional immunotherapy. So, um, and we have some people that have, some significant asthma that are on immunotherapy. So I was curious, um, when you said there was no exacerbations of asthma, how, how severe or mild their asthma was in these trials? They had to have, uh, I believe these patients were only allowed rescue medication, so they would be really technically intermittent. Okay. But there have been studies, Paul, that actually have specifically looked at it. And I know the, um, the other product, which is called GRASSEC, specifically looked at asthma, uh, patients who had asthma and showed that there were no um, exacerbate, no safety concerns about asthma in a group that was being treated for, the endpoint was rhinitis, but they looked at asthma in terms of uh, uh, being more prone to adverse effects. Okay. And there also have been studies that looked at asthma, so I, I don't know that these studies have specifically looked just at asthma. For grass pollens. I mean, I'm sure there's patients who only have asthma, but it's usually rhinitis symptoms uh, that during a seasonal allergen that gets studied. And these are quality of life. This is almost always a secondary outcome. This probably matters more to our patients than their combined symptoms for diary, but uh, there were significant changes in uh, most of the. Uh, questions on their quality of life global school also include. I'm going to move on to dust mite. The, um, so anyway, what I just told you with graphs is looking collectively at the literature, um, there is um, significant efficacy, at least in these robust uh, grass tablet studies that include hundreds of patients. Within the first treatment season, when they are started at least a few months before season at a range of 15 to 25 micrograms of a major allergen. There was actually recently, just this month, uh, a study that looked at a solution product in Europe in children. I think I'm blocking on the dose, but it's a bit higher, but not that much. Um, they did demonstrate efficacy as well. Uh, somewhere in the 40 microgram range. It's, it's uh, Ehrlich 1 is the lead author. And so the solution studies, in my opinion, are a little bit more mixed in terms of consistently showing efficacy. And I didn't have that slide for grass, but um, I, it did show more inconsistency in the earlier, older, slick grass study. And it's definitely a range, a huge range, in dust mite efficacy dosing, um, at least collectively in the published literature today, somewhere in the range that I uh, 15 to 700 micrograms of the combined species among. But there was a meta-analysis uh, performed 
uh, and published a couple years ago, and it looked at split for dust mites for allergic rhinitis and asthma. And it was very favorable. The standardized mean differences were about 0.95 for symptoms and a little bit higher for medications. Um, and this was um, this particular study is actually looking at a dust mite tablet. Uh, it was presented at the European Academy Congress in 11, and this looked at a, a tablet product that was dosed for a year, looked at two different doses, 300 IR and 500 IR. And um, there was not as great a magnitude of difference as we saw with the glass products, but about a 20% improvement in the higher dose product. They did look at uh, when efficacy began. It was about four months into treatment. This is, um, this is looking at it for a treatment year. And then they stopped. And then they noted that about eight months after treatment cessation, efficacy started to wane. So this looked at a, month, a year of treatment of a dust mite tablet. And honestly, to date, I have not been able to find out what the microgram dose of the, of the 300 IR or 500 IR product is. And um, then the treatment effect starts to wane eight months after treatment cessation. But again, what we looked at with the grass tablet duration of efficacy was three years of treatment. So this you really can't make comparisons because this is only a one-year treatment study. Dust mites actually been studied in the United States. Bob Bush actually conducted a study that was funded by the Complementary Alternative Medicine arm of NIH camp. And it looked at 31 house dust mite allergic adults with rhinitis plus or minus asthma. And they were randomized to receive either high or low dose or placebo. In high dose, it was about 5,200 AU, or which is about 40, 70 micrograms of Duraf-1. So that's about almost a half a ml of full strain undiluted dust mite given daily versus one microgram versus placebo. And let's not talk about that. <laughs> what? He said, let's not talk about that. I don't want to think about swallowing dust mites. <laughs> oh, just wait till we get to cockroach. I can't wait. <laughs> oh, it's coming up. <laughs> so it's, this is this was good. Um, there was improvement in two two of the outcomes. There was such a dropout that um, um, it was such a dropout by the end of the study, it was hard to read a lot. But uh, there was a significant improvement in bronchial threshold to dust mite challenge in the high dose group, and also a uh, rise in specific IgG4, which is what you'd expect. Um, the treatment adverse effects were similar in the three groups. Um, uh, one patient had an aphthous ulcer and local swelling that lasted four hours. I guess that was the more severe. And one patient uh, had IBS, increased diarrhea. The local swelling sometimes can be severe, and there have been case reports of persistent adverse local reactions with slit. Um, occasionally, they report it. So local reactions can be bothersome. But this shows that looks like you know if you were to if you were to pick up something, and think, oh, I want to try dust mite. This might give you an idea of what you might try to start with with a solution. Extract. Cat and dog. Cat, as far as I know, we've had two published studies. The dosing difference with them is huge. Uh, the higher dose study used 2.3 times the cumulative yearly dose of the lower dose study daily <laughs> and um, did not show the clinical efficacy in comparison with the placebo group. And they both essentially used the same outcome, which was a cat challenge, cat room challenge. So a little disconnect here uh, between uh, two cat studies. So from what I understand in Europe, if you own a cat and you're allergic to it, no disrespect to European colleagues, um, uh, tough. <laughs> you get rid of the cat or whatever. But we, we're more touchy-feely, and we you know, do things to let people keep their animals. And as far as I know, dogs have not been studied. Uh, rag, ragweed, uh, the dosing might be different for solutions versus tablets. And now we've had several US studies that have been uh, published or uh, presented at our national meetings. Last year, there were three 
posters at the I think three featured posters. I'm stalling here. Oh there. Okay, let me go back. Um, the first drag we tablet study looked at uh, one, two, three, five doses. Um, and it was just published. Uh, uh, Angel Lee Nyack is the lead author, and it was just in last month's allergy proceedings. I apologize, I haven't updated it. Um, but they had some severe reactions in the 24 and 50 microgram group, and they decided to proceed with uh, the 6 and 12 microgram dose for further development. And so there have been European and clinical uh, American, North American uh, trials that have been conducted in the past couple of years looking at this Ragweed tablet. They added a one microgram dose. And in this year's Academy meet, meeting featured several posters. The 12 microgram dose appeared to provide the greatest efficacy with a, with a dose response, uh, nine in the one and 19. And there were no significant adverse effects other than the expected local reaction. So the 12 microgram dose looks like it's going to be the dose that will be developed as a tablet dose. And this is also, again, um, uh, this is teasing out just the North American patients. The other results that I showed was a uh, combined European and, and North American clinical trials. And again, for specific scores, you can see the 12 uh, microgram uh, tablet performed better than the 6 microgram tablet in terms of specific scores, nasal and ocular. And a solution ragweed study followed that dose, that uh, phase one dosing study that I showed you earlier in the beginning of the uh, US clinical trials section of this presentation that we're conducted. We went on to look at two doses of ragweed versus placebo, 4.8 versus 48. Um, both groups achieved a 15% reduction in total symptom scores compared with placebo, which is not statistically different. And there was also a favorable change in the immunologic parameters that you would expect with the slip group, but not with placebo, which is good. When they did a post hoc analysis, teased out the group that had the highest symptoms before season, um, they, they did need statistical significance in terms of improvement over placebo. And this is, actually has been replicated in European studies where they tease out the groups that had the highest symptom scores before, or the greatest disease burden, I would say. And there is a much greater magnitude of improvement in the group with the highest symptoms before they start. But kind of seems almost obvious, but in terms of meeting clinical efficacy, this, this particular study could, couldn't be taken to FDA because the whole group did not meet statistical significance. So they went on and did another study, um, and this has not been formally published yet, either as an abstract. It came out as a press release, and, and I, I, it was brought to my attention um, through this press release. Uh, but it has been uh, submitted to the Academy of Abstract, and I would presume it would, uh, I can't imagine it wouldn't be accepted uh, at this and presented at this upcoming meeting, which is in February in Texas. But it, this, again, is a large uh, multi-center study for 29 patients, adults, history of uh, two years of moderate to severe ragweed allergic rhinitis. The dosing, I'm not entirely sure about, but it, according to the protocol, it's up to 42 units, which is micrograms of AMB, AMB1 for a minimum of eight weeks before season and during season. 27 North American centers and primary alpha must combine symptom medication scores. And in the intensive treat analysis, it met its primary endpoint with a 43% reduction in the total combined symptom medication use score, which is the largest, one of the largest percent improvements I've showed so far. According to the report, no cases of anaphylaxis or epinephrine use, and none of the SAE serious adverse events were judged by the investigators to be attributable to the study treatment. And as with almost all the clinical trials, oral pharyngeal symptoms are, were fairly common and seen more in the slip group. So that's, that's the kind of 
to date, I would say extract manufacturer slash pharmaceutical company clinical trials. So what you've seen is ragweed's made uh, is making headway, grass uh, tablets is making headway, and ragweed both in a tablet form and a solution form seems to be uh, meeting primary outcome. Uh, this next study I told you, you I know you're waiting for a cockroach. <laughs> Um, this is an NIH-sponsored study about what is the principal investigator, and actually these slides were provided by him. I think I modified them to, make, um, to kind of condense some of the information. And this is a biomarker study looking at SLIT in adults uh, to see if um, you get the expected immunologic changes. But they didn't look at symptom scores. It was really a biomarker study. And um, this is the dosing. I thought this was interesting because I really never knew what the major microgram dose was in the extracts that we're using, but uh, their dosing went to about 420 microliters, and in that there was uh, 5.2 micrograms of LOG2 in the slip administered daily. Little lower than what we saw in the pollen studies. Remember 15, 25, ragweed, 42. And they saw a variable response in IgE antibody, which goes to rise and then come down with the extract, but it was um, looking at the group that was uh, not consistent, but the IgG response didn't bump, <laughs> just like the placebo. So the uh, investigators concluded that there were significant differences in specific Ig response seen in subjects in the active group versus placebo, but they were not consistent. And there were no significant differences detected for other biomarkers such as IgG, Ig for and blocking antibodies. Subsequently, they went on, or they're going on to look at a couple other studies. They're going to look at uh, biomarker-based studies for cockroach SPIT, and then looking at a higher dose for SLIT, and including the pediatric population. And this is the SPIT study. They went up in the SPIT study. Remember, cockroach, I think to date there's one published study that has shown a very small study that showed some efficacy. Uh, for subcutaneous immunotherapy for cockroach. And I know when we updated the practice parameters, <laughs> it's very difficult to find support for the use of cockroach. But anyway, they looked at a dose that's uh, 15 micrograms of lab G2. I think it was administered weekly over, yeah, weekly maintenance for 15 weeks. And, and in this particular slide, this is the uh, IgE response. So you can see you get uh, more brisk. IgE response, and I don't have the IgG data, but I think it shows what we'd expect in terms of rise in IgG. There's been no U.S. studies with Alternaria, but there's been a few published studies that have demonstrated efficacy with Alternaria. A, a lower dose than we've seen with the pollen studies, but this is not different from what we've seen in the effective Alternaria skip studies where Dosing uh, efficacy was established at about two micrograms of all eight points. So this particular first bullet point is a study that looked at 1.25. Small study, but um, there was significant improvement in symptom medication scores. And in this particular study, there was no change in uh, specific IgG4, which again you would expect. And you have, we have seen, I didn't show you any of the immunologic data, but those big RAS studies do show the expected improvement in the immunologic parameters. And this is a study that was conducted in the U.S. that looked specifically at the question of multi-allergen skit, sort of the way we slick, the way we practice, where we put about 10, some of us put 10 allergens in a bottle um, and, and then we'll inject, versus uh, you looking at the allergen alone. And the question that was being raised is, with sublingual there's an absorption issue. It's only kept underneath the tongue first, and then it's swallowed, and once it's swallowed, it's degraded rapidly and it's degraded. Whereas skid, it's injected and has to, I would imagine, be processed somehow. So this was uh, done at National Jewish Health Nelson as the principal investigator, and he looked at Timothy with diluent or Timothy with up to nine other allergens. And the dose of Timothy was the same. That 19 micrograms of LEP1 daily. And he had a, an observation year where he looked and gathered symptoms, and then they were treated, 
quite a few months before season, and then they went into the active treatment. And the problem they ran into was the active treatment year where they were gathering symptom and medication scores was a record low for rainfall and also record low for grass pollen counts. And again, this underscores one of the real problems with um, allergen immunotherapy clinical trials that require natural exposure as the testing point for a primary outcome. Does that make sense? Is that okay? So, as expected, there was no difference in symptomatic medication scores in any of the groups because they didn't have symptoms. <laughs> but the Timothy alone group had significant improvements in all the secondary, all the what would be considered the secondary outcomes, which was titrated prick skin tests, nasal challenge, specific IgG4, uh, decreased interferon gamma. Whereas the multi-allergen group only showed some improvement in titrated per skin test, and the magnitude was not as great as the Timothy alone um, extract. So this raises questions about the efficacy of multi-multi-allergen split that probably needs to be put to rest. Um, so what we have seen to date with solution and for uh, tablet studies are single allergen studies. And even the few limited multi-allergen slit studies, and this is one of them, this was just published, it's not in print anymore, it was just published a month or so ago, I apologize for not updating. Swami is the lead author. It's an interesting study where they looked at dual allergen slit. It's a U.S. study, it was conducted at Stanford uh, University, and uh, they randomized uh, individuals to dual slit, which was just my and graphs or placebo, and they looked at subjective and immunologic parameters. The cumulative dose, as you can see, is about uh, 5,000 micrograms of 3P1 and 73 micrograms of the combined decimites. It was roughly 20 and 15 micrograms of the individual allergens administered daily. And th these are kind of the objective parameters. This is nasal challenge, and this is dual slit. And this is looking at the specific titrated for skin test data. And you can see both for dust mite and Timothy, there was a significant reduction in titrated for skin tests. And then there was a favorable response in the immunologic parameters that we looked at. So this suggests that dual, um, dual two allergen slip, they were administered separately. So it wasn't the same bottle. Uh, it can be effective. I'm going to skip this. This is just an interesting study that looked at three comparisons. Well, I'm not skipping it, so. <laughs> but it looked at slit versus skit versus uh, skit first, and then flip over to slit. And I, when we first had that advisory scientific board, I, and we first came together in the U.S., the Greer Scientific Advisory Board, to discuss, this is one of the concepts that was kind of thought about. Can we put them on skit and then go over to slit? We use them with skit. And um, the better outcomes were actually seen in, in, in the, the groups that actually received SKIP in terms of all the different outcomes that were looked at. So this is a little bit of a slip versus SKIP, but not quite. So asthma attacks and inhaled steroids uh, decreased compared with baseline values in the SKIP and SKIP plus SLIC groups, but only at 12 months in the SLIC group. Rhinitis was significant only in the SKIP plus SLIC groups increase in the levels of regulatory cytochromes were observed in both skit and slip. And um, the allergen-specific IgG increased in skit and skit plus slip, but not slip group. And the few previous studies that have looked at these kinds of things have, in some cases, shown a little difference, in, but often do see the immunologic changes in the skit and not necessarily the slip. But the slit alone studies do see it, so there's a little bit of conflict there. Um, so there's still questions in terms of slit efficacy. Uh, studies suggest that eight weeks before season, but other studies actually that I didn't present, the European studies have shown in an environmental chamber challenge that you'll see efficacy uh, within a month of treatment. And uh, there's another study yet to be published that showed two months before season and then co-season and then stop and pick it up the next year, did as well as four months and as well as the previous uh, studies that have shown year-round treatment. Optimal duration, uh, it, we have now 
two products. Uh, the, both of those grass tablet products have looked at two-year data post uh, treatment uh, cessation and show sustained clinical efficacy. And there are questions uh, that remain about the efficacy of multi multi allergen slip, all in one body slip. Um, in terms of safety, still to date there's no fatalities, and I think I heard about two billion doses. Almost all the adverse reactions occur within the first uh, couple weeks of treatment, and they're almost all oral pharyngeal. There have been a couple case reports, and a uh, couple, two of them at least, have been in patients that had previous skid systemic reactions that required them to stop treatment and um, two of these cases occurred with the first grass tablet. So the majority of adverse reactions occur in the beginning of treatment. To date there's been no fatalities. The World Allergy Group document on SLIP recommends that SLIP only be prescribed by allergy trained physicians and specific instructions should be provided with regard to management of adverse reactions unplanned interruption in treatments and situations where SLIP should be without. And that's a lot of thought needs to go into that because the guidelines in Europe say that if there's a pharyngeal, uh, oral pharyngeal infection, you don't administer it. If there's gastroenteritis, it's not to be administered. Because there's a thought, at least with uh, pharyngeal lesions, ulcers, that they may be more rapidly absorbed and it may um, contribute to a systemic reaction. So bringing you fast forward up to date, we still have no FDA approved product. That means that we don't have a code for billing and, and billing for it would uh, most likely um, be uh, for off-label treatment and there is a code for unspecified treatment that could be used, but um, more often than not patients actually um, uh, pay for it themselves. And this is two surveys that were done by the college in 07 and 11, uh, Mike Tankersley group conducted them both. Uh, the second survey hasn't been published, but it's been submitted to annals and probably will be published. And I'm just underscoring the difference in number of prescribers. So about 6% of the U.S. and, and 07 of the college responders said they're prescribing slip, and this is almost double in 11. And um, it remains the most common answer is why, why, what prevents you, and that's lack of an FDA approved product. Uh, and effective dose of U.S. licensed product is not known. So I'm going to just fast forward to adherence, and I just want to show that, that um, the old study, but this was a study that looked at pharmaceutical uh, prescriptions. Uh, extract manufacturers are able to track number of refills in the same patient population. And one of the things uh, was noted is there's a pretty, very similar skin. <laughs> drop off in the terms of year, the end of year one in terms of lack of adherence to SLIP. So it was thought in the beginning SLIP would uh, be uh, improving adherence, but apparently that's not the case. And this is just, this is still in press, but it looked at children based on age. And um, it was three, under three, three to four, and four to five. and um, this is a busy slide, but what it found was about 46% of the 150 children discontinued slip within the first year. <laughs> and it was highest in the under three group, and you can see um, that uh, there was equally poor compliance with tablets as well as solution. So uh, adherence would have to really be considered um, and how to, um, because again, unlike SPIT, uh, SLID is administered at home. So, the, I mean, there's some questions that need to be considered how you're going to monitor adherence. What kind of instructions are you going to give the patient? Are you going to give them an emergency uh, treatment plan that includes injectable epinephrine? How long, if they miss their dose, and you know that's probably going to happen, how many days can they miss their dose before you're going to want them to come back in or do whatever? Um, so that concludes my formal uh, presentation, I think. Um, well, this is an old slide from uh, the college presentation, but um, as you can see from what I've presented, it's a fair percentage of um, prescribers, uh, I, uh, U.S. physicians are now starting to prescribe this, and, um, but um, we still have a lot of questions that need to be answered. So again,
Linda, where are people that are prescribing it getting it? They're using U.S. licensed products. Uh, that was in Mike's first, Mike Tankersley's first survey. Uh, they were using U.S. licensed product because that was one of his questions. I've only, I haven't seen his full paper. I just, uh, oops, sorry. I just uh, email communicated and asked him uh, if he could, you know, answer some of the questions that we had, uh, he had looked at before. But there, and that uh, hopefully will be forthcoming in the annals pretty soon. So, so the stuff that's licensed but it's not FDA approved? Right. What you're doing is using a product off-label, which we do all the time with, with medications. It would be like using a certain antihistamine for urticaria that never got that approval. But it, it, it's, it is important, I think, to let patients know that you're using it off-label. Um, this is a recent uh, <laughs> Uh, email that David Weldon had sent me, or maybe it's not so recent, it's probably a year, but the woman, this made some news, it was a press type thing where the woman said she was nearly killed by her slit and her doctor didn't tell her it was over the counter. And this is an older lawsuit that settled for 350000 and again, a man that had a systemic reaction called 911, used FD a couple times, but declined going to the emergency room recovered, but then filed a post-traumatic stress syndrome lawsuit. And the legal principles that were emphasized in this case was lack of informed consent, appropriate instructions, uh, and then treatment that was not in the practice parameters. And also that the patient wasn't informed that it was off-label. So these points came up. Linda, the other, this the was other. a Texas Medical Board, board she filed a complaint with them, uh, and that was a lawsuit. But it, People are expecting to, you really need to tell them you're using it off-label. Don Aronson, when I read his Black Box, Box Jackie article, uh, also says that when you're using something off-label, you should explain the scientific rationale for why you're using it off-label. These are kind of, the, this has been a slide in my presentation for years, but these are the things you'll have to think about if you're actually going to start using it. And I, I don't know the answer to unplanned treatment interruptions. I, I, ask my European colleagues, how long do your patients go before you say, uh-uh, you come back in and take your next, next dose? And what, what clinical situations should they not have their dose? The European guidelines, which were published in 06, as I mentioned, GI, oral pharyngeal, I think it said infections, and then also it, it had a criteria with FEV peak flow or FEV1, which should be greater than because they, I mean, they've seen the uh, problems with oral immunotherapy to foods if someone has a, a fever or any kind of infection. Right. So I, I would think it would be something similar. It hasn't, I have not seen that, I haven't really seen that show up in the published literature for, uh, for aero allergen. Although it's kind of a warning in the European, and the oral pharyngeal I, I wasn't aware of until if some of these uh, small um, meetings that we've been to where this uh, discussion, because I, I didn't find anything in the literature that said this serious adverse effect was thought to be due to the fact that a person had an aphthous ulcer. It's kind of more speculation that that might pose a problem. I don't well, think we that's evidence that, that, but it kind of makes you <laughs> a little, little nervous. Uh, okay, make sure you don't. <laughs> don't have a, an ulcer when you take this yeah, we, have, we have time for one more question. Does anybody in the audience have a question for uh, Dr. Cox before we let her go? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Linda. We appreciate you coming once again and, and speaking with us. Um, hopefully, we'll have some more answers uh, about this in the future. Um, I'm just uh, One quick thing I just want to ask, what is, the, what is the cost of this for a year's dosing compared with um, um, subcutaneous. Do you have any idea? Yeah. Can we go back right here? No, nope, wait a minute. I did number crunching back in, um, uh, this was 06, and I looked at if we were to give the daily, a daily dose of what we give injected monthly. I used AOK's 2006 list price for U.S. products. I calculated based on what what that would be 
uh, given daily, you know, our injection dose. I'm not saying it's the effective, and this is what I got for cat, dust mite, and grass. Of 2,223. If you were aiming for the daily dose, we give them an injection treatment. Little less if you were looking at, and Greer did their own number crunching on their own and shared it with me. And what I, it was similar to what I found, so I thought we were kind of um, both in the same ballpark. You see this? It's 2,000 by yeah. my calculations. And, and their number crunching was a, a little different, but similar. Okay. Well, thanks again, Linda. We appreciate um, you spending the time with us. Um, and um, we'll let you go now, and, and uh, hopefully you'll have a good weekend. Thank you, Paul. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to acaai.org. See you next time.